From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Edward G. Robinson in Bullets or Ballots with Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. Lux presents Hollywood. Bullets or Ballots? This is the question answered in tonight's play, the vivid drama of a battle against racketeers. Screened by Warner Brothers... You'll hear it starring Edward G. Robinson, Mary Astor, Humphrey Bogart, and Otto Kruger. While our special guest is Frank B. Gumpert, nationally known criminologist. Louis Silvers conducts our music. Now, just a word before hearing from our producer. Your complexion and the care you give it... Despite his success in the petrified forest, Bogart signed a tepid 26-week contract at $550 per week. He was immediately typecast as a gangster in a series of B-movie crime dramas. He played a supporting role in Bullets or Ballots, released in 1936. Bogart reprised the role of Bugs Fenner on the Monday, April 17, 1939 episode of the Lux Radio Theater, opposite Edward G. Robinson, Mary Astor, and Otto Kruger. It aired at 10 p.m. Eastern Time on CBS. Lux was Monday night's highest rated and CBS's highest rated show of the 1938-39 season. This episode's rating was 21.1. Roughly 14 million listeners tuned in. Gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Racketeering is a comparatively new word in the American language, but an old bugbear in American history. Cecil B. DeMille was introduced at the beginning of every episode as producer, but he was actually a well-paid frontman. His duties were reading the scripted introductions to each act and commercial aid in interviews with the stars at the end of each show. The real man behind the program was the J. Walter Thompson Agency's Danny Danker. Each show was a five-day commitment, beginning with a Thursday table read. Rehearsal was Friday, run-throughs with sound effects were Saturday, and Sunday had readings with sound and orchestra. The first dress rehearsal on Monday morning was recorded for director Frank Woodruff's final critique. The final dress rehearsal was held with an audience at 4.30, and the broadcast aired live at 6 p.m. Pacific time. shown in tonight's play, Bullets or Ballots, can America purge herself of these internal parasites? I don't think I've ever seen you in a picture, but uh, you were playing the part of a tough guy. What do you think about that sort of typecasting? Well, I think typecasting at it sounds bad. Actors don't like it. But I think it kind of helps you because I think Gary Cooper in a big hat and tight pants and guns on his waist has done very well. And uh, I think it makes stars out of people. I think that I gained the attention of people because I was supposed to be a tough guy, because I shot people and killed people. You heard me, Al Blake. Nobody else but Blake. I tell you, the guy's double-crossing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shut up! Now, wait a minute. I said shut up! That means you too, Bugs. I'm running his outfit. Oh, I know. Well, I'm the chief. I tell you that all the time. I don't get it. Good evening, gents. Well, thanks for the fast legal service, Al. What's the matter? What is this, a wake? It might be. Seeing the papers? <clears throat> New racket raids, net 21. Hmm. Nice picture of McLaren. Yeah. The boys think you're working for him. I'm wondering. I'm not. Bug, shut up. What have you got to say, Johnny? Oh, sure, sure, Al. I just uh, sold you right down the river. <laughs> the cops said they were sorry they kicked me off the forest. Why, McLaren sent me a basket of flowers for hitting him on the jaw. Said if I want to come back, he'd give me the whole Bronx to wander around in. I wouldn't clown, Johnny. Ah, oh, we're wise to you, Blake. You're true. Oh, no, I'm just starting. Hey, now listen, cop. Take your hands off. <laughs> I don't like guys that put their hands on me. Just let's keep this a business meeting. All right. Start talking. Al, I want to work for you because you wanted help. I didn't come to you. You came to me. Now you think I crossed you. Well, I couldn't get a dime a dozen if I handed this whole mob over to the cops, and you know it. You can see now why you need help. Well, and you need plenty of it. Hey, Al, are you going to let this guy talk his way out? Shut up! Keep talking, Johnny. <laughs> Never fails, does it? When mugs get in the jam, they always start off by knifing each other. Hey, I thought you were smart, Al. What would you suggest? Well, let McLaren have his fun. You can't stop him. As soon as he's made a showing, the grand jury will fold up right under him. They always do, you know that. Sure. And meanwhile, we sit back and wind up broke. No, spend your time building up new rackets. 
So the McLaren comes up for air, he'll find a dozen more going. Just pull them right out of the hat, huh? No, you just go to work. Quit playing cops and robbers. Stop knifing each other. I suppose you've got a good record in mind. Well, name it. Sure, I've got one. Numbers. Go ahead. Now, what's the odds against picking the right number out of from one to a thousand? Well, a thousand to one. That's it. Now, we take the last three numbers of the racetrack payoff every day. The suckers try to guess it. And the payoff is 600 to one. That is, if anybody picks the right number. Now, a lot of people will try to pick that every day if one dollar would win them 600. Oh, what are you trying to sell us? That Penny Andy game Lee Morgan's running up in the Bronx in Harlem? Well, it's so Penny Andy that she's picking up 12,000 a week out of a few neighborhood stores. Most of the bets are nickels and dimes. Now, seven million people in this town, and all of them looking for easy money. You just offer them 600 for one and watch this thing spread like a four-alarm fire. And they won't be playing one number apiece. They'll be picking four or five. Now, if you want to control the winning number, you can pay off on racetrack bets and manipulate the totals. I all it needs is organization. You get a million people buying numbers every day, and this one racket will clean up $300 million a year. Why, it's easy. It's a cinch. Three hundred million. That's right. Did somebody say something about Penny Andy? All right, you fellas beat it. Mr. Blake and me want to talk business. I said beat it. Okay, Mr. Kruger. Nice talking, Blake. (sighs) Now, sit down, Johnny. You know you're a pretty smart guy. Yeah, my mother used to say I was going to be president. Miss Lee, Miss Lee, I, I gotta see you right away. What's the matter, Herman? Where'd you get that shiner? Oh, uh, Miss Lee, it's important. Come inside. Well, Herman, spill it. Uh, they, they, they took the money away from me. The numbers money, the bag and everything. Who did? Uh, I don't know, some men. They stopped me on the street. They told me to keep my face out of there. They said I couldn't even make collections no more. Oh, they did, did they? All right. Sit tight, Herman. What are you going to do? They're mugs, Miss Lee. I'm going to tell Johnny Blake about it. He'll run those chiselers right off the end of the 93rd Street dock. Wait here. I'll be right back. Front boy. Oh, clerk. Clerk. Yes, miss? I was told that Mr. John Blake had moved here. Uh, That's correct. I'd like to see him, please. My name is Lee Morgan. I'm sorry, but Mr. Blake isn't in his room. He left just a moment ago. No. Thanks. You're very welcome. Evening. Are hey, you looking for Johnny Blake? Why, uh, yes, I am. Well, my name's Brenner. Maybe I can help you. I gotta find him right away. Hey, ain't you the Lee Morgan who runs the numbers game in the Bronx? Yeah. <laughs> I hear they started running you out of it tonight. Well, they won't get away with it. Yeah, I know. It's a dirty trick. I don't blame you for gunning for Blake. Gunning for him? Yeah. He's the one that's taking it over. Blake. You're a liar. Oh, he's grabbing it to put himself in strong with Al Kruger. Why don't you go in and ask him? He's in the coffee shop. Yeah? Thanks. Hello, Johnny. Hmm? Oh, Lee. Well, uh, sit down, Lee. Thanks, but I may not be staying long. No? What's on your mind? Just one thing. Are you taking over the numbers game, Johnny? Well, are you? Yes. Why? I can't tell you. I see. I tried to take you in with me. Sort of worked out better to toss it to the wolves, didn't it? Well, I... uh, Well, I I thought they'd let you keep on running your end. I guess that wasn't poetry about friends finding an easy place to break the back. So long, Johnny. Good luck to you. But Warner Brothers had no interest in raising Bogart's profile. Their studios were often unair conditioned. He thought the Warner's wardrobe department was cheap and often wore his own suits. His jobs were tightly scheduled and repetitive, but he worked steadily. He played wrestling promoters, gangsters, a scientist, and a few good men dragged into bad situations they didn't deserve to be in. Bogart and his second wife Mary divorced in 1937. He married actress Mayo Method on August 21, 1938. It was an unhappy one filled with outbursts and mutual violence. The press called them the battling Bogarts. Dissatisfied with his work, 
Bogart rarely watched his own films and avoided premieres. He issued fake press releases about his life to satisfy public curiosity. When interviewed in person, he was too candid. Later saying, all over Hollywood they advise me. You mustn't say that. That will get you in a lot of trouble. When I remark that some picture or writer or director or producer is no good. I don't get it. If he isn't any good, why can't I say so? If more people would mention it, pretty soon it might start having some effect. The idea that anyone making $1,000 per week is sacred and beyond the realm of criticism never strikes me as particularly sound. Bogart made 29 films between 1936 and 1940, developing his now famous film persona. Cynical, self-mocking, vulnerable, charming, and above all, a loner with a coat of honor. It was his next two roles, however, both with John Huston, that would catapult him into A-list status. <laughs>